Okay, uh, we should be live. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, can you guys hear us and see the presentation? Can you please let us know in the chat? Okay, perfect. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, so this is our orthopedic webinar series by Mind the Bleep. Uh, this is our eighth edition of the series about pediatric orthopedic presentation today. Uh, Dom has kindly agreed to uh, deliver this topic, so uh, very a big thanks to him. Uh, apologies for the delay, uh, but without further ado, I will hand you off to Dom so we can get started. Uh, you can take over, Dom. Cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, apologies for the delay. As always, uh, work always runs late when you need to rush out the door. But uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening, and thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Um, this evening, I have been given the brief on talking about some pediatric orthopedic presentations, um, sort of some general approaches to examining uh, kids and some safeguarding issues. Um, and without further ado, let's have a little look at what we're going to be covering this evening. So uh, I don't know if individuals have been attending the last seven sessions. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a general approach to orthopedic imaging and uh, managing orthopedic patients in general. Uh, I'm going to touch a little bit on safeguarding, uh, non-accidental injury, and some potential issues with consenting of young children in England. Um, and the cases that we're going to be discussing involve hips, uh, supercondylar fractures, and forearm and wrist fractures. And then if I've got any time at the left, I'm going to sell you on why orthopedics is an awesome career. But the fact you're listening makes me think you already agree. Um, as always, a uh, disclaimer before we start, I've used gratuitous stealing from Google Images for educational purposes, so there's been no intended infringement of copyright. Um, I'm a CT2, I'm not an expert, so always escalate locally and appropriately. Uh, just a bit about myself, so I finished up my undergraduate training in St Andrews with a BSc Ons in 2014. Uh, I then finished my MBCHB in Glasgow in 2017. Um, after that, I undertook two years of foundation training in Yorkshire and Humber. Uh, my F3 year out was six months of joint reconstruction at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital, working with uh, Prof Skinner, the BOA president, and uh, Chet and Jada. Um, I then did a bit of Amy locuming because one should always locum on your year out. Um, I'm just finishing up my core training in Yorkshire and Humber region at the moment on a uh, CT themed program with orthopaedics. Um, I achieved my MRCS uh, Glasgow this year in 2022, and I've just been appointed a ST3 starting in the West Scotland rotation for orthopedics. And I've always loved the bones. Uh, they are great, and I'm going to tell you more about why they're great at the end. So hopefully that enthusiasm shows through. So a general approach to uh, orthopedic patients, a general approach to pediatric orthopedic patients. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how to approach examination of patients, uh, a bit about a, a sort of strategy to look at describing plain films so that you don't get flustered and some sort of general admitting advice for uh, any pediatric patient that you will come across. Um, before you're asked anything in any examination scenario, whether that is at the uh, medical school level, whether you're doing foundation training simulation, whether you are looking at uh, undertaking your initial membership exams, um, the safe approach to any patient is always to adopt a, an ATLS algorithm, so uh, Advanced Trauma Life Support, uh, which is a program run by the American College of Surgeons and sub-licensed by the Royal College of Surgeons England, which teaches a systematic approach to managing patients with uh, multi-system polytrauma. And the CRISP course, the Care of the Critically Ill Surgical Patient course, is looking at a, the management of patients from a more medical perspective uh, with a sort of an A to E format looking out to address um, sort of more medical type problems with a patient with a holistic viewpoint looking at all their pertinent investigations and, and, and sort of taking a approach to the patient that really sort of minimizes post-operative complications. So anytime you're asked anything, don't jump straight into talking about the fracture that's straight up in front of you, you start with a scenario saying, you know, I would approach this patient with an ATLS algorithm approach, I would approach this patient with a CRISP type approach. Um, and when you get on to discussing examination and looking at the patient, once you've assessed that there's no pertinent life uh, sort of threatening injuries from an ATLS perspective, from a CRISP perspective, you want to ask yourself, where is the pathology in the patient themselves? Um, is there the potential that there is referred pain, particularly with looking at patients uh, with hip or knee pain with the shared femoral and obturator nerve supplies that these joints 
share, quite often you can see referred pain from one region presenting in the other. Equally, is the issue actually abdominal? I've seen patients be referred with acute hip pain to the assessment unit who have actually turned out to have appendicitis and ended up going for appendicectomy. Um, or patients with psoas abscesses, um, as you have abscesses down the posterior uh, abdominal wall in the retroperitoneum. So always keep an open mind when you're assessing patients and try to think where is the pain coming from. And once you've established that and taken a thorough history, you're then going to need to examine the patients. Um, and generally, aptly's look feel move approach is the one which is uh, usually happens at least at uh, the sort of level that we'll be discussing today. You want to look at the joints uh, systematically from the front, from the sides, from the back, from underneath. Uh, you want to palpate the joints. Uh, you want to feel along joint lines. You want to feel what the soft tissues are doing. You want to feel for crepitus, look for open wounds. Uh, and then you're going to gently passively move the joints um, after assessing the patient's active range of motion because you want the patient to move and see what they can do before you start aggressively moving their limb for them. Um, as well as examining the joint above and below, which is always good practice, uh, it's always important to make sure that you consider examination of the patient's spine, particularly for children with hip pathology, um, and make sure that you examine the gait. Um, so when you're seeing patients with uh, hip pain, or knee pain or ankle pain, it's always a good idea to see what their gait pattern is, whether it's antalgic, whether they're willing to move at all, whether they're hopping. Um, and getting them to do all of this can be quite challenging, depending on what their age is. It's quite difficult to accurately assess somebody's uh, neurovascular status and have them verbally confirm this if they're sort of a toddler or if they're crying or an extremis. And if that's the case, say what you see and keep it simple. You know, do, is the child uh, holding their arm? Is the child moving the arm? Are they moving their fingers? Um, is the child highly distressed? Does it cause them more distress if you move the joint in a particular manner? Um, saying what you see can be particularly helpful even to quantify whether the patient's condition is uh, getting better or worsening, even if you can't document exactly what's going on with their neurovascular status. Um, when you're looking at joints, always bear in mind, are there other injuries, particularly in pediatric patients when we are considering always whether the injuries are isolated or whether there's a potential non-accidental cause of their injury. When you're examining joints, you want to describe any obvious deformity that you can see in the joints, such as this image on the left with this obvious ankle fracture where you can see tenting of the medial malleolus, where there's threatened skin, suggesting that this closed fracture may indeed become open if there is an emergent reduction in plaster cast immobilization. Whether the soft tissues are displaying bruising, uh, whether there is tracking of any blood or hematoma. Um, when you're looking at injuries, open wounds can be incredibly subtle uh, or they can be less subtle. Um, and it's important that if you see any graze or cut or anything around a fracture site, the fracture must be treated as open until proven otherwise, which means the usual uh, boast British Orthopaedic Association uh, of Trauma Guidelines approaches to open fractures with emergent cover, antibiotics within an hour, appropriate tetanus cover, making sure that the wound has been photographed, covering it with clear gauze, and making sure it's been discussed with both your senior registrar or consultants on call and indeed discuss with your local orthoplastic center. Um, when it comes to examining the upper limb, it's quite difficult to start working out initially where all of the nerves go and how to describe these uh, in the documentation. Generally, again, most guidelines around injuries such as supracondylar fractures, forearm fractures in children, all of these describe making sure that you individually name and describe the sensation and motor supply of the median nerve, of the radial nerve, and of the ulnar nerve. And as you can see in this image, you can see that there's both a palmar and a digital supply to the uh, median nerve component. You don't need to worry too much about that. I will accept that if you've tickled the index finger and documented that the radial nerve sensation is intact as a uh, soon to be registrar, I'd be quite happy with that. Uh, the ulnar nerve supply on the little finger for sensation and the radial nerve supply for sensation at the base of the thumb in the anatomical uh, snuff box region here. I wouldn't start getting too worried about the majority of the nerve supply in the forearm. 
or the upper limb. However, I would specifically mention with shoulder and clavicular injuries, making sure that you describe the regimental badge area over the deltoid supplied by the uh, axillary nerve. Uh, with regard to movements of the upper limb, your upper limb movements are generally supplied down at the hand with a combination of the ulnar nerve, describing the intrinsic muscles of the hand for both palmar and dorsal abduction and adduction. The uh, radial nerve taking control of both wrist extension and tricep extension and the median nerve taking care of wrist flexion and finger flexion at the shoulder it's important to quantify both flexion and extension of the joint as well as uh, internal and external rotation and again when you're examining the limb you are looking to describe uh, what the patient's active range of movement is what they are comfortable with as a passive range of movement um, and making sure that uh, if there is significant issues in that range of movement that the uh, that all of that is uh, documented. Um, with regards to the hand, I think it's particularly worth mentioning uh, that hand injuries are often missed um, and I would always pay particular attention to those with distal radius fractures or fractures of the forearm to making sure that you've examined the hand sufficiently. Make sure that you palpate the entirety of the way along both the phalanges and the metacarpals palpate around the, um, the, the carpal bones. And with regard to examining the thumb and the scaphoid itself, uh, telescoping the thumb, applying axial load along the direction of the metacarpal to impact the base of the metacarpal against the scaphoid, along with palpation along the snuff box and the scaphoid tubercle, may ascertain tenderness of the scaphoid, potentially suggesting fracture. Um, it is less common in children than it is in uh, adults significantly, but uh, if you are examining the distal radius, it's always just worth doing. With regard to examination of the lower limb, the, the motor supply of the uh, lower limb has a couple of uh, facets which are worth mentioning. The deep perineal nerve down at the top supplies the first dorsal web space in between. Uh, the, the first toe and the second toe, and making sure that you specify whether the deep perineal nerve sensation is intact, as well as the sensation from the uh, nerve supplying the foot with the medial or lateral plantar nerves, uh, the saphenous nerve coming down the front of the thigh, sorry, the front of the leg as a branch of the femoral nerve continuing from the uh, front of the thigh down, and the sural nerve on the lateral aspect of the leg along. Uh, originating at the course of the lateral malleolus as it ascends the leg uh, with the short saphenous vein. Um, when you're examining the joints of the lower limb, uh, I pay particular attention to uh, flexion and extension of the hip, um, particularly in pediatric cases where you are concerned about hips in children, uh, sort of toddler age, baby age, um, what can often be quite telling is they'll be quite comfortable uh, with their leg held in a certain position of flexion and adduction simply to open up that space in the joint capsule if, they're cons if, if there's a joint effusion or uh, pus in there, uh, potentially increasing the hydrostatic pressure in the joint. And children will put their leg in this position in order to relieve the pressure on the joint. So it's quite telling if you walk in and they've got that sort of uh, flexion deformity. You can gently increase this range and then try to internally and externally rotate the hip a little in these patients as well to see whether that will uh, worsen symptoms. Um, and again, you want to abduct and adduct the leg uh, in and out to see whether that makes any significant difference as well, both with the leg uh, in extension and indeed in flexion. Um, the knee joint itself is a fairly simple joint. It's a hinge joint, um, merely flex and extends, but it is worth noting whether there is significant varus or valgus deformity in the limb. Um, the the, the non-PC telling is that um, uh, the, the varus and valgus deformity is remembered by uh, the, the gum in between the legs sticking them together uh, uh, and the and the rum spreading them apart, which is probably the not something that we talk too much about these days. But you you, you certainly want to note whether there is any discrepancy in the in in the alignment of the joint. Um, and again, the ankle joint itself again a fairly simple modified hinge joint where again uh, flexion and extension inversion and eversion of the ankle joint and it can be quite telling particularly with the ankle the alignment of it when you examine the ankle from behind so again make sure that you've done that 360 degree assessment of the patient and you've examined um, examined them from behind to look at any limb length deformity 
or indeed whether there's any significant abnormality in the gait or at the position of the hip as it's held. So moving on to describing images from a orthopedic perspective, what you want to do is when you're starting to describe orthopedic images, I will say, keep it simple. Um, you want to delineate which view your x-ray is. You want to describe which bone is being looked at, which region of the bone the abnormality is. And then if you can, look at describing the fracture pattern and whether it's a closed or open type injury. When you're looking at views of the foot, uh, you've got anteroposterior views straight through the back, oblique views from the side, and then lateral views as well. Um, when you're looking at ankles, AP and lateral views are hopefully ones that you've come across before, but specifically when you're looking at the congruity of the uh, tibiotalo joint, a mortise view can help ascertain whether or not there's been any significant uh, tailor shift or tailor displacement indicating an unstable ankle fracture. So if you are unsure on an AP and lateral view uh, what you're looking at, you can always request a mortise view. For a hand series, again, you can see AP and lateral films or TA and lateral films. And again, you can request oblique views if you are suspicious of any pathology not being picked up. Um, if you are suspicious of scaphoid injuries, you can always request scaphoid views in particular. Um, and remember, if you're examining the joint above and below, it is always worth imaging those joints and obtaining full length views of the bones in question. Uh, if you're unsure as to exactly what's going on and you're, you're, you're unable to pinpoint the exact issue. When it comes to describing which region affects the bone, um, it's easiest really to describe it in either a proximal, middle or distal thirds of the affected bone. And then when you, once you tell which third it's in, you can consider describing whether the injury is in the diaphysis, so either in the shaft of the central part of the long bone, in the uh, epiphysis, so the ends of the long bone, um, and in, uh, in, in, in children, it is uh, always, worth mentioning whether or not you think that the metaphysis is involved. So the zotha grown between the epiphysis and the diaphysis um, and, and whether you think this region of the growth plate is potentially involved. We'll talk a bit more about salt, a bit more about salt or Harris fractures uh, and the patterns in a second. Um, but you also want to ascertain whether the fracture, particularly in uh, joints, is intra-articular, where so the fracture line extends up into the joint surface itself or whether it's an extra articular component where the joint, self, uh, the joint surface itself remains congruent. When I mentioned the Salter Harris fractures, there are five types, and uh, there's a reasonably easy to remember mnemonic, which I always thought helps, um, where type one through the growth plate is straight through, so that's S. Uh, the type two fractures through the growth plate in the metaphysis are remembered as A with above, so these fractures are uh, above, the uh, epiphysis at the end of the bone. The type three fractures are lower, so they are the lower half of the plate and through the epiphysis. Uh, the type four fractures are trashed uh, because they go through all through each element through the uh, epiphysis, metaphysis, and diaphysis. And type five injuries are the R, so they are wrecked injuries where you see crush injuries of the growth plates, which are very subtle to pick up on occasion and are very easy to miss. So when you break down what uh, are the commonest presentations of Salter Harris type fractures, it's actually type two themselves that are the commonest. Um, type two fractures occur uh, cause 75% of all fractures involving uh, growth plates in uh, pediatric patients. Unfortunately, the uh, rare hard to spot type five injuries are quite uncommon to the extent that this image doesn't even give it a percentage. Um, but as you can see in this image here, if we were to put all of these principles together to describe this X-ray on the left, uh, what I would say is that this is a AP and lateral forearm view of a skeletally immature individual. I would confirm when this x-ray was taken and that it was the most recent film available and confirm the patient identity. The most obvious abnormality on this film is a closed fracture of the distal third of the radius demonstrating a Salter-Harris II pattern. Um, 
But when you take it back and actually apply all of those basic principles, that potentially complicated sounding presentation of an x-ray is actually quite simple. I've talked about what film it is. I've mentioned what bone it is. I've said it's closed. I've mentioned the pattern and which reading of the bone it's in. And I have put the cherry on top by describing the Solder Harris 2 pattern. So it's really not that hard once you start getting the hang of it. You can start adding in fracture patterns once you feel a little bit more confident in assessing multiple, you know, getting confident with x-rays and, and describing what patterns you're looking at. And based on what the pattern of the x-ray is, is that you're looking at, you can start trying to work out what force has been applied to the bone in order to cause it to break. Generally, uh, comminuted fractures with uh, multifragmentary bone components describe a high energy type injury. Uh, that or the bone itself is physiologically abnormal and a small amount of stress has caused it to completely fragment. Spiral fractures are of particular importance and I'd like you to pay attention to this pattern because a spiral fracture of a femur in a child is always of concern, particularly in those who are non-ambulatory, as the torsional force applied to the bone potentially suggests that this has been twisted in a non-accidental manner. Uh, with regard to uh, transverse fractures and oblique fractures, depending on the direction of the uh, oblique displacement, uh, there is uh, either a medial or lateral force applied, and you can see that by open bending on the other side. And with regard to green stick and uh, buckle fractures, these are particular fracture patterns which are uh, themselves unique in children. Uh, and the reason for that is the fact that children's bones are more likely to um, bend than break completely due to the fact that they've got thicker periosteum. So the periosteum is this white layer of thickness on the outside of the bone here. And that thicker periosteum is also responsible for the blood supply to pediatric bone. And that's also a large part and reason why children heal faster. Um, also why their bone has got a much higher capacity for remodeling than uh, adult bone. Now this elasticity does lead to uh, these unique fracture patterns and green stick fractures, um, which have been named after sort of green wood, uh, which is when you, you bend one side of the bone and you get a partial fracture on the other side. Um, torus fractures, on the other hand, uh, occur at metaphyseal locations in, in this uh, longer part of the bone that we described here. Uh, and they are said to be caused by impaction with a force acting on the longitudinal axis of the bone. And, and typically uh, it's an axial force that's been applied um, through a, a fall on an outstretched arm where you see a small buckling uh, of, of, the, of the cortex. So these more subtle ones are ones not to be missed. They still need to be treated as fractures uh, and mobilized properly and followed up properly. As uh, I have seen the occasional buckle fracture, even at my junior stage, which has uh, then gone on to end up as a complete break. Uh, the most important thing I like to say is that um, it is imperative that when you are getting x-rays of any fracture that has been demonstrated, you ensure that you've got post-reduction images. Um, I've lost count of the number of times that I have ordered post-reduction images on patients in the emergency department and they have been sent home or discharged without these images occurring. And it doesn't make you look very good or clever in the trauma meeting. So if you're able to, um, I try to do my best to stick around uh, with patients that I'm concerned about or that I think have got a higher aspect, uh, sort of a higher risk of uh, leaving due to departmental pressures or whatever. So if, if you've reduced it, or if you've been involved in that reduction, it's your responsibility to make sure that you've got post-reduction images, that you are satisfied with them, and that you are happy with the uh, discharge of that patient. Um, and making sure that you've documented pre and post neurovascular scores will come on to in a second. With regards to general admitting advice for patients, particularly working in Leeds as a major trauma center and complex uh, tertiary pediatric service, it's important to note that orthopedic issues may not be the only issues that a patient has. Much like in the way where when we clerk our adult patients suffering with uh, elder, elderly sort of fragility hip fractures, they're often palmed off on the orthopods, these patients. Um, people see a fracture and they assume that that's the only problem that the patient has. And you always have to be thinking, what else can be going on with this patient? Is there a uh, suspicion of non-accidental injury? Is this the only traumatic injury the patient has? Is there 
social factors going on at home that make you think that the patient is at higher risk? Are there potentially congenital issues or deformities which need addressed? Has the patient got a cardiac issue which potentially needs discussed with anesthesia if you are looking at uh, performing an operation on this patient? Don't just write them off as that's a fracture, it's a simple clarking. Um, but that being said, it's the usual history that you're taking from patients. It's a history, it's a presented complaint, uh, and a history of presented complaint, drug history, allergies, uh, vaccinations, uh, any, any hospital stays, stay in long-term baby units. <clears throat> but as always, there are a few orthopedic specific things to think about. If the patient is very unwell, if you think they are septic from an infection, if you are concerned about the fact that they may need urgent escalation to theater or uh, involvement of pediatric team due to unwellness, or there's any suspicion of non-accidental injury, you must escalate it to your consultants on call. You must escalate that to your registrar on call. With any surgical patient, if you think that they may need operative intervention uh, urgently, uh, it's always a safe idea to keep them nil by mouth and find out when their last meal was. If you are going to keep them nil by mouth, make sure that you have asked your pediatric team in the emergency department to be helpful uh, and offer to get an IV line, offer to start intravenous fluids, sort them out with symptomatic medication. And again, always be careful with pediatric prescribing. If you're anything like me, your pediatric experience is less so than your adult experience. So triple check your fluids, triple check your medication dosages. Um, with regard to specific investigations in children, in my personal experience, um, unlike adults, bloods are a bit less important. Um, so, you know, most adult patients of the elderly persuasion will not be going to theater unless they've had a coagulation, unless they've had a full blood count, uh, unless they've had their urea and electrolytes checked and they've got their group and saves available. Most pediatric patients do not uh, necessarily need to have all of the blood tests and images, uh, sorry, all of the relevant blood tests performed. That said, if you are suspicious of something like a septic joint or a septic hip, it's imperative that you get a CRP. It's imperative you get a full blood count and set of U's and E's. If you're taking them anyway, you're as well doing your group and saves for theater. With regard to imaging, we've talked about pre and post reduction imaging, imaging the joint above and below. Do you need to consider any other images? Is this actually a patient who's presented as something that should have been a major trauma and needs consideration of a CT trauma series? Do you need to organize an ultrasound of their hips uh, or knees looking for effusion, particularly if this is done out of hours? Um, has this already been performed very recently? Do you need to consider things like an MRI scan? Again, if you're not sure, escalate. Um, with your patients, if a manipulation has been performed and there's potentially been a cast applied, again, your post reduction images, and making sure that you've given consideration to things like traction, particularly for things like lower limb fractures and femoral fractures, uh, and with regard to things like elevation, uh, you know, does the hand or wrist need a Bradford slit to uh, hold that, hold the arm up? Do you need to ensure that they've got pillows underneath the ankle if there's an ankle fracture? Um, and I was always told, if you are worried about a child, just admit them. You will never be, or at least you should not be, chastised for being worried about a kid and admitting them to either a place of safety or a place where a senior can review them in the morning um, if they do not necessarily need seen overnight, okay? So on to cases. So I tried to pick out a few different cases uh, from common presenting complaints, and uh, I'd hope to try and make this a little bit more interactive. Um, so I think that there's a chat function which hopefully our moderator might be able to read out some answers from. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, if the first case goes very slowly, I will just start giving you the answers, which maybe is what you want. So scenario one uh, on forearm fractures, you are called by the emergency department team to review a six-year-old child uh, with an arm. And that's what they tell you. They say, it's an arm. And you say, what's wrong with the arm? And they say, oh, well, they're quite upset and distressed, doctor. And the mum's quite upset. They've taken an x-ray, but I don't really know what it shows. Um, and you have a look at the x-ray images, uh, which are up on the screen. So my first question is, what do you want to know from the history? And uh, hopefully some folks are going to start typing out some stuff about what they want to know. So uh, I'll be uh, reading out the chat, Dom, and I'll let you know what people say. Yes. Excellent. We've got a few here that said mechanism. 
Good. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, mechanism of injury, any possible trauma, previous injuries. Uh, good, good. People are asking how it happened. Does it look like it's a possible twist? Yeah. Uh, previous admissions, any any bone problems in the past, the time of injury, and a few other, uh, yeah, uh, how, how did it happen and if it was witnessed? Crack it. So I'm really liking the fact that everybody's talked about mechanism of injury and making sure that that matches the fracture pattern. I am loving the um, checking of previous hospital admissions. And uh, again, it sounds like we're having high concern for non-accidental injury, um, which is also good. So the usual points from the history always still apply, even in the orthopedic setting. You want to know about things like vaccination status. I don't mean for COVID, but you know, childhood vaccinations, previous time on any uh, high care baby units, uh, asking if there's any drug history or any history of drug allergies. Um, and uh, making sure that you've uh, checked, you know, so how they get on at school, what's their favorite subject, but the social history aspect is again a, a, another potentially important point to glean information from. Good, okay, so the next question is how will you examine this patient? Which I'm hoping the answers are going to be excellent for. Okay, so we'll just give them a second to type in their answer. Okay, so somebody said assess the pain level. Good. Um, we have a closed or open fracture, uh, neurovascular sensation in the hand, um, pain level again, sensation and movement in the fingers and the pain level, the grip strength, and then uh, Elnor said look, feel, and move. Good. Uh, Lubna said motor and sensory, uh, examine the wrist and also the elbow. Good. Uh, look, feel, move, depending on the pain. Somebody said ATLS approach, uh, depending on the injury. Um, a few people saying A2E assessment and then doing a neurovascular examination and checking the range of movement. Great. So the important thing about all of those answers is, uh, you know, you all sound safe. And in any interview for core training or again, your MRCS level, the fact that you said, you know, you're going to approach it with that A, B, C, D, E, ATLS approach and then examine the joint with a look, feel, move and neurovascular status, you've already scored top marks. So, top answer. So, right, let's try and make this a bit more difficult then. Tell me how you're going to initially manage this patient. Okay, so uh, a few answers are saying analgesia. So they're starting off with analgesia. Uh, back slab, uh, pain relief, pain relief, analgesia. So can we take it a bit further, peeps? So have a little look at that x-ray on the lateral view and have a think about how you're going to manage that. Somebody's asking, is the patient neurovascularly intact? The patient uh, in this scenario is neurovascularly intact. Okay, so we have a few. So somebody said, Nisha said reduction and a back slab. Uh, Sophie said, do we need to reduce? Um, so closed reduction and analgesia. Yeah. Uh, analgesia, reduction of the fracture, knees reduction. Somebody said admission and theater for Nancy Nail. Theater for a Nancy Nail, behave. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, analgesia, x-rays, and immobilize. Okay. Uh, then check the x-ray afterwards. Somebody said the TNO referral. Sorry, a, a, a DNR referral? A TNO, TNO. A TNO referral. I was like, DNR, risk back. Okay. Um, <laughs> We're talking about pediatrics here, so yeah. hopefully not. Uh, we have a K-wire closed reduction. So, okay, cool. So we've got lots of answers, and this is good. We're thinking about it. So when you are asked any question about a surgical pathology, never be too quick to jump in and offer a definitive surgical strategy in the exam or in your interview, okay? Trick is to take a step back and you would probably give an answer along the lines of, I, after approaching this patient and assessing the neurovascular status and determining that they are neurovascularly intact, which they are, and presume they are in this scenario, I would need a discussion with my, uh, if you're comfortable doing it, 
with my emergency department colleagues regarding providing a emergent conscious sedation within the emergency department for emergent reduction and plaster cast immobilization. Now, all of you who said below elbow slab or back slab, uh, no cigar. If you had simply said to me, I would need to do plaster cast immobilization, you've got the mark, that's good. But with forearm fractures, particularly of the mid shaft involving the radius or the ulna or the radius and ulna, it's important to make sure that you have got above elbow immobilization because if you haven't, you're still able to pronate and supinate with a below elbow slab. The point of a below elbow slab, whether you've got a back slab or a, or a volar slab, is to prevent you from doing wrist flexion and extension, moving the distal radius when you've got a fracture. But in mid shaft fractures, you need an above elbow, okay? So you, you reduce the fracture, uh, and after application of a cast and reassessment of the neurovascular status, you consider whether the patient needs to be admitted or discharged with uh, discussion at a trauma meeting. And then you need consideration of whether this fracture is amenable to conservative management options, because many forearms are, or whether you need to consider surgical strategies. And then you stop talking. Um, because if the examiner is very kind, they will move on. And if they are very cruel, they will start asking you about your surgical strategies, which I made you in a second. But good, we're all thinking. I love it. So when you are reducing fractures, there are three principles to reducing fractures. Well, there are many, but we're going to talk about three. With regard to bones, you need to get them out to length. So you need to apply sustained gentle traction, which is increased in order to bring the bone back out to the appropriate length. Because as you can see in this previous image, this overlap here suggests that there's a bit of shortening. So you need to correct that shortening. And then afterwards, we need to talk about the alignment. So correcting the alignment allows you to correct for both varus and valgus deformity and significant angulation of your fragments. You then need to consider the rotation. So whether you need to do something to bring the bone back round to its position where it should be by providing torsional force to the arm. And after you apply your length alignment and rotation, hopefully you've got the fracture reduced. Now, when you're applying a plaster cast, you need to have a few things. You need a competent assistant to apply the plaster and a &E is full of them. The a &E staff members who have done their plastering course are better than most regs I've come across, myself included. Um, and the trick is, after you've got the bone in a suitable position, or at least you feel it's a suitable position, the aim is not to lose your reduction when you are applying the plaster cast. So for fractures of the forearm, you want the hand in a neutral position, flexed at 90 degrees. I've heard lots of talk about uh, whether you want the forearm in uh, pronation, supination, or neutral. And at my CT2 stage about to start reg training, I still can't understand which is which, but I've never been criticized for putting the hand in a neutral position. So just do that, it's safe. Um, once you've got the arm at that 90 degrees position, you want to apply uh, a padding to the arm. So you can see the stocking it underneath the arm, uh, which is just a big sock that's pulled up the arm and a little thumb uh, hold cut, and then applying bandages over the top. Uh, you want to apply a half roll, meaning you've got a roll of bandage, and then you want to put another roll around uh, half the diameter of the of the bandage to make sure that you've got min a little bit of overlap, but not too much is demonstrated in this picture, and not too loose as it is in the picture above. The other thing that is worth mentioning about these casts and uh, stocking it is that it shouldn't really cut well. It should not come above the level of the metacarpal heads, and you need to make sure you're all the way up above the elbow. Up a good part of the forearm. And a small tip with regard to applying bandage, if you haven't done so, uh, much like when you look at toilet roll and posh hotels, there is a right way and a wrong way to do it. Um, when you apply the uh, bandage with a under technique, uh, trust me, it's a lot easier to roll out. So next time you get the chance, <coughs> have a play and you'll see it unrolls much, much easier when you're applying it. However, we all know that that is the correct way to hang your toilet roll. When you're applying a back slap, you need to make sure that you uh, apply it again all the way up the forearm and coming down so it's either at the wrist joint or extending to where it's at the MCPs. But again, uh, as long as you have got a slab that covers a good ulnar portion of the arm and supports it coming up around the elbow and the arm, uh, you're, you're covered. And afterwards, you need to complete that with a bandage around the whole lot. 
so that your layers are then uh, patient and then you've got potentially stocking, you've got uh, bandage, you've got plaster cast, and then uh, you've got your uh, other bandage on top. There are excellent casting courses that are available uh, nationally. There's good ones in Bradford, in London. Um, most of the colleges run them, but I did mine in Glasgow when I was an undergraduate student for like 20 quid, and it's the same course when you're about to do your reg stuff. So if, you get on a, if, you, if you're interested and you want to do a casting course, definitely recommend it as a good day. And as always, <coughs> after you produce, remember to redocument your neurovascular status and remember your post-reduction films, okay? Uh, so your patient returns to clinic on day 10 and the following films are taken. And uh, these are now the images that you are uh, seeing in clinic on day 10. So I would like our audience to tell me what's happened and I would like you to discuss with me what the options are. So just waiting for the answers to come through. Uh, somebody said uh, malunion. So uh, somebody said it's not well aligned, so healing will be impaired, uh, needs a surgical plan. Uh, back slab not put on correctly. <laughs> not healed as hoped. That's, that's, that, that's a way to fall out with your registrar. Oh, I think you've applied the slab incorrectly, Mr. Wall. Oh. Ooh. Uh, Anna said, not healed as hoped, poorly aligned, likely operative management, uh, new plan, child not resting limb appropriately. Yeah. Uh, somebody said for the trauma. And so, so we, we've correctly identified, or at least uh, some of us have, that the initial reduction, you cheeky individuals, the initial reduction and in application of the cast showed a satisfactory alignment of the of the bony fragments here so you can see that we've got reasonable reduction here of these bones here but unfortunately forearms especially if both of them are fractured are inherently unstable so we have unfortunately lost the position of the reduction at day 10 and we failed conservative management so you are quite correct after failing a conservative management trial with a good reduction uh yes it looks like a operative plan may be needed can anybody tell me what the options are for fixing these operatively? No is also an acceptable answer if you can't talk through the surgical option. So uh, somebody said pins or plates, question mark, uh, MUA, or if, Uh, K wires, K wire fixation, upper reduction and plate application. Cool. So we've evidently heard of some fixation options, which I like. The trick is, in orthopedics, there is many ways to skin a cat, and it is a combination of. And I'm about to save you all a thousand pounds from the fracture fixation course. So the AO trauma group describe a combination of the patient personality. So what does the patient need to get out of the operation? What's the fracture personality? So what is the fracture pattern like and what is the pattern going to be amenable to? And what is the surgeon personality? So what can I, as a surgeon, offer the patient that is within my skill set? And it is less about looking at a particular fracture pattern suggesting that's a forearm fracture that needs an O-Riff, or that's a fracture pattern there that needs a Nancy nail. What it is, is, is trying to look at the fracture and determining what do I have within my skill set to induce an environment conductive to bone healing. And the two big bone environments that we talk about are um, absolute stability environments where we are allowing the bone to heal by primary bone intention um, with bypassing of fracture callus formation and direct uh, aversion canal drilling by our osteoclast, or whether we're looking at a relatively stable environment where we are inducing secondary bone healing 
and allowing a small development of micro movement at the fracture site to simulate callus formation uh, and a little bit of hematoma. And then letting things settle down. Now, intermedullary fixation using Nancy nails, whether you're needing to use one nail or two nails, and it's perfectly acceptable in some scenarios to use one Nancy nail because you know with an intact fellow bone, you're going to get one out straight. If you can get one out to length and look at where the other one will follow suit without necessarily having to use metal. However, some will require two. And you can use intermedullary nails uh, to induce a relatively stable environment in fractures. Uh, with open reduction internal fixation, it's not just the fact that you're using plate and screws. The question is, what are the plate and screws trying to achieve? Do you want a DCP, a direct compression plate, where again, you have an absolutely stable rigid construct? Do you need a bridging plate where you have screws at either end of the fracture and nothing in the middle, allowing a little bit of relative stability and wriggle room in the middle? Do you need a buttress plate in order to try and support the bone back up the way like the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Do you need a neutralization plate because you want to neutralize forces going through the joints? It's all this stuff to think about. And, and it's not necessarily saying it's one method or the other. But the trick is to say something along the lines of, I would look to induce a, uh, a primary or a relatively stability construct. I could do that using any of the following. And then you say your answers, you know, your nails, your open reduction, internal fixation, using plate and screws, external fixators, whatever it is. Um, but good, we know some options. I'm very impressed. Right. It's probably enough waffling about forearm fractures. Let's do some pediatric sepsis. So you are called by the ED team to review a child with a painful left hip. They are under one years old and they are concerned as the child has been unable to mobilize and has a low grade pyrexia. So question, what are you concerned about and what are your differential diagnoses? And I also want to know how you are going to approach assessment of this patient. So uh, there is a few septic arthritis. So uh, septic arthritis, septic arthritis, septic hip. Do they want to have any differentials other than a septic joint? septic joint somebody said they would like to know about the family history and of the observations of the patient good uh differentials uh mary said hip dysplasia uh, nisha said septic hip dysplasia or synovitis yep yep uh lubna said about approaching the patient will approach in an a to e assessment uh somebody said femoral fracture there is a non-accidental in uh, injury here also good uh transient synovitis uh but not sure of the age on that though cool so excellent differentials um i'm pleased that we all thought about a septic joint i'm pleased we all talked about an a to e assessment i'm thrilled somebody talked about non-accidental injury um the the possibility of it being a knee problem i'd like us to try and remember as well what we talked about earlier with referred pain from hips and knees um, it could also be proximal femoral osteomyelitis as well as a septic joint as well. Um, and always remember the weird and wonderful things. Um, always remember things like tumors. Um, always remember things like myositis. Um, always remember things like, um, particularly in slightly older children, uh, things like purse disease or, or, or sort of um, uh, idiopathic arthritis or juvenile onset arthritis. Um, DDH, again, in this age group, and missed DDH can be absolutely catastrophic. So excellent that we remembered uh, hip dysplasia. Um, and I quite like the way that we're approaching this child with an ATE assessment before examining the joints. Um, so with regard to uh, examination of the hip joint, I should ask as well, does anyone know any tests for hip dysplasia? So uh, a few people said Barlow's. Cool. And Ortolani. Great. So if you don't know about that, so with Barlow's, you are 
flexing the hip and pushing back to see if the hip is dislocatable, and then or landing your abducting the legs out to see if you can relocate the joint back in. I'll be honest, I've never done it, but I'm hoping I have a pediatric orthopedic job too. Um, cool. So does anybody know of any criteria to aid differentiation of a septic joint from a non-septic joint? And if you do, for a bonus point, can you tell me what those criteria are without using Google? Somebody said history of the temperature. Great. Blood tests. Yep. Fluid in the joints. Uh, maybe fever, hot, swollen, or red joints. Uh, aspiration. Okay. So we were right with temperature over 37.8. But Cocker's criteria doesn't necessarily use the... Um, the, the, the way that the joint looks. What we're talking about with the modified Crocker criteria um, is looking for uh, the, the presence of four separate aspects. Um, you need a temperature, you need a change in the white cell count, uh, you need a child who's non-ambulatory, um, and, and you need, uh, you, you don't actually need x-ray evidence, but you also don't need to make sure that you've aspirated the joint either. Um, with regard to uh, looking at um, tests for the patient or any other investigations. Um, does anyone know what tests we'd look for or what views we'd want on the x-ray? Somebody said frog leg. Great. Fluid around the joint. Um, Dylan said AP and frog leg. Great. So, yeah, AP and frog leg views and um, in regards to other blood tests. So, blood tests already, somebody said earlier, ESR. ESR. CRP. CRP. White cell count. Go on, he's got pyrexia. Set to six. Culture's in a lactate gang. I'm sure somebody was typing it. Um, but I, I, I want to know what those are as well. Um, and that's mainly because your initial management, depending on how unwell the child looks, uh, you may not want to muck about waiting on all of the tests and dilly-dallying. It may be that somebody needs to go to theatre for emergent aspiration and washouts. Um, so your initial management, you need to keep your patient nil by mouth until you're sure what's going on. You need to find out what's going on the trauma list uh, and what's going on the acute list to see if there's any capacity to get your kid in um, if you think that they're going to need to go. Um, even if the child is uh, suffering from a low-grade pyrexia and not themselves, um, in kids, your systemic parameters of infection may only remain mildly elevated or normal. Kids compensate really, really well with their new score until they suddenly go off a cliff. Um, and depending on how unwell they are, your options are either admit them and get them an ultrasound in the morning and keep watching them overnight with serial nursing observations and uh, re-evaluating things if they start to look like they're getting more poorly, or whether they're coming back for an emergent ultrasound in an orthopedic ambulatory service and, and sort of being seen. But to my mind, if it's a kid and a baby, I probably err on the side of caution. Um, so I suppose we've just talked about that, actually. I've talked too far, but okay. So if, if instead uh, you, your child um, has a temperature over 38 and a half and they're unable to mobilize with the CRP being pending, what, what's your options for management? How do you go about doing so? So Lubna said uh, antibiotics. Okay. Uh, and analgesia. Okay. Uh, Anna said antibiotics and pain relief. Keep overnight and observe by Nisha. 
I like that. So somebody said uh, fluids, uh, IV fluids. Yeah. So with a kid like this, if they are persistently pyrexial, they cannot mobilize. Clinically, everything is pointing towards a septic arthritis. Your initial management, what you're looking for is an SHO, um, or at least a good F1 who is reviewing, uh, an excellent F1 who is reviewing patients, is starting to get the ball rolling. I want to know um, that you have spoken to theatres. I want to know that you've got me the relevant consent forms for booking and marking the patients. I want to know that they have started to be resuscitated appropriately. I want to know that the patient themselves uh, is starved. I would be quite upset unless the patient is moribund, I'm exaggerating a little bit for effect, but if you give antibiotics in a septic joint before you get aspirates, you may have knacked the culture results. Now, even in individuals who come in uh, serially very unwell, these individuals are sometimes gonna go to theater overnight. And I would always caution giving antibiotics to somebody that you haven't discussed with your senior first, because I did it once and they were quite upset with me simply because it can really affect your biopsy results and, and affect, your, affect what treatment you do. It's sensible to think about it because if individuals are floridly septic, you are correct. We do think about giving them antibiotics within an hour, but discuss that with your consultant, discuss that with your reg. I'd say, I'm, you know, I think it's very reasonable to say to them, you know, they've been persistently tachycardic, they've been persistently pyrexial, their blood pressure is not very good despite fluid resuscitation. I want to give them antibiotics before we get to theatre. You're not going to be shot down on that at all. But for somebody who is mildly pyre you know, pyrexial, but their bloods are coming back, everything else looks fine, and it's just the temperature, I hold off antibiotics until you've spoken to somebody senior. All right. Um, for those who haven't seen frog's legs and AP views, that's what they look like. The advantage of the uh, frog legs views is it allows you to measure a Southwick angle, which is a thing that you look at in um, slipped up femoral epiphysis disease, but you don't need to worry about that. Um, you only see x-ray changes in septic joints where you have erosion of the femoral head at the very late stage. Um, that joint has been unhappy for a very long time there on the right. What you may see is a very sort of subtle sclerosis uh, around the joint. Uh, if it's been going on for some time, then the very acute stages, often the x-rays will be normal. What the x-rays are useful for is trying to determine whether or not there's an obvious cause on the x-ray for why this child is presenting such as a fracture. Um, hip ultrasounds are incredibly useful and what you can sometimes see on an uh, ultrasound is a effusion uh, between the joint capsule and the femoral neck. And if that space is increased with fluid, it can suggest that something's going on, either of a reactive nature or of an infected nature. Um, it is not uncommon um, for in individual children with grumbly hips to have, over a several week period, sort of, they grumble along, they have an ultrasound, it doesn't really show too much. They grumble along, they come back, it's still a bit unhappy. Maybe they have a second ultrasound because the CRP has gone up. Um, and then what they end up having is an MRI after a consultant review or staying as an inpatient. So your first line investigation is ultrasound. And it's important to make sure that both hips are ultrasounded. It's important to make sure that both knees are ultrasounded. Because again, things like juvenile onset arthritis and the like, uh, maybe not necessarily than a one-year-old, but it's important to make sure that it, this is either isolated or a sort of polyarthropathy. Um, with regard to operative management, I myself haven't seen this being done, but to give you an example, uh, what you can do are, are arthroscopic washouts rather than open washouts. Open washouts are, um, are, are indicated in some cases, but the vast majority are at least initially managed arthroscopically where you put windows and ports into the joint capsule, allowing you to wash it out, uh, marking out the anterior superior and expand the greater trochanter and going in uh, going in between them 
in, in, in order to access the joint capsule. Right. I am aware that it is now 10 past eight. In theory, I have two cases left to discuss, or I can go on to non-accidental injury. I don't want to run it too long. What do people think? I think generally people are going towards uh, discuss and continue the cases. Oh, really? Uh, there is a few non-accidental injury uh, and a few that want you to continue with the cases. Oh, yeah. uh, it's up to you, Don, but maybe if you want to discuss the non-accidental injuries and do the cases so the people that want the non-accidental injuries can oh, see. Oh, so they can stay behind. Oh, okay, cool. Right. So let, let's do NAI and then if people can be bothered sticking around, then uh, I suppose they can. Um, oh, I'm giving you, I'm giving you all the spoiler alerts. Right, so we'll skip on a little bit to safety and NAI. So, okay, so we always bang on about non-accidental injury uh, in, in children, and there's a reason why. It is incredibly important. In the Western world, non-accidental injury is the second commonest cause of infant mortality. So that is why it is important. And every week I turn on Netflix, there is another documentary about an unfortunate unfortunate child that has suffered horrific events and at multiple stages those responsible for looking after them failed and to my mind if i'm seeing a child i i have that onus of responsibility there and then to do what i can for them and that's not to say you have to go in being pessimistic and miserable about every patient you see and treat every patient and parent with suspicion but it's important to make sure everything matches up does the history make sense? Does this child have the ability to be ambulatory? Do they seem uh, as though they could have inflicted the injury that they have? Um, does the mechanism make sense with the pathology that's being shown? What is the fracture pattern? Is it a, a sort of a concerning spiral fracture of the femur that we discussed earlier with a sort of torsional force in a non-ambulatory child? Have you got concerns about rib fractures where quite subtle on this x-ray that's not blowing up, but you can see these little subchondral lines here and sclerosis on these little ribs, particularly on the on the sort of posterior aspects there. Um, you, you know, our, our rib fracture is something that needs to be picked up. Has the kid got multiple bruises? Is there suspicion of a head injury, either from blunt force trauma or axonal from where a child has been shaken? Um, how is the child presented? Have they come in with their parent? Has the parent rushed them in urgently, highly concerned, distressed, upset? Could the parent not give a monkeys? Do they seem a little bit withdrawn and concerning themselves? Um, how, how, how are the social risk factors? Is this a child who is doing well in school? Um, is this a child from a uh, single parent household, from a low socioeconomic area, um, from a, a household where there have been significant recent stressors? And I, and I don't say this to generalize or judge these patient demographics. It is simply the case that these, these uh, bouts of evidence, you know, evidence suggests that these are social risk factors for non-accidental injury. Um, and again, it's important to have risk factors in mind when we assess people. Remember that there are different types of abuse that children can experience. Um, there are physical violence, there is neglectful violence, there is emotional violence, there is sexual violence. And again, all of these things need to be considered when you are examining patients. I would always say that if you are being concerned about uh, any particular type of abuse, um, again, making sure that you have documented the red flags that you have come up with and documenting your suspicions clearly. Even if something is just not quite right and you've got that gut feeling, the sensible thing to do is to sensitively escalate that to your immediate registrar on call or your immediate consultant on call, speaking in confidence, particularly to your senior nursing staff, your a &E pediatric consultants, and organizing additional x-rays and skeletal surveying images, as well as making sure that you have admitted your patient to a place of safety. 
It may be that it is a healed set of rib fractures that you can see that in principle don't actually require medical management, but from a social point of view, you must admit that child. And the other thing I'd say is, and it's difficult when these are very emotive subjects, uh, and, and they are challenging interpersonal situations, which we can feel particularly stressed or angry or angstful for. But try not to be quick to judge because there may be other factors going on. Um, and try to be as uh, supportive and non judgmental and um, as understanding as you can be given the circumstances of what's going on. Um, skeletal surveys are. A choice study to evaluate suspected cases of child abuse, and they are the gold standard for detecting additional injuries. So they should include frontal views of your appendicular skeleton. Uh, they should include the uh, upper and lower extremities with frontal and axial views of the skull, the spine, the ribs. And depending on what your survey finds, they may need additional imaging, uh, whether those are specific uh, X-ray plane imaging, whether those are CT scans, whether those are MRI scans of brains, again, looking for uh, axonal type trauma from brain injury. Uh, interestingly, um, head injury is the commonest, it's, that's the most frequent cause of morbidity and mortality secondary to child abuse. Um, it is not usually uh, thoracic or abdominal or limb trauma that causes these children long-term detrimental effects. If, if something is going to affect them long-term, more often than not, it is unfortunately a head injury. Um, some evidence suggests that uh, you should obtain a skeletal survey in all patients with suspicion under the age of three uh, and selected patients between the ages of three and five. Um, after the age of five, there was a paper published in America where Cocker et al. looked at all the cases of child abuse um, in one of the American societies. It was a fairly big paper, um, but they suggested that after the age of five, you could potentially use a skeletal survey less sparingly and you can rely more on the physical examination. But um, at our stage, it's not necessarily our decision. Um, and, and escalating appropriately is your main port of call. Um, a skeletal survey is reported more often, uh, it's, well, most usually by two consultant radiologists. And they are um, usable in a court of law. So skeletal surveys are often used as evidence in child abuse cases. Um, with regards to keeping an open mind, one should keep an uh, open mind regarding differential diagnoses in these patients. Um, maybe it is a true accidental injury and it's just a funny mechanism. Uh, have they got an underlying bone disorder? Have they got something like an undiagnosed case of osteogenesis imperfecta? Um, have they got osteopenia prematurity? Hence, it's important to make sure you quantify time in a special baby unit, method of delivery, um, and all that stuff. Um, are they potentially suffering from a deficiency, whether it's vitamin C causing scurvy, whether it's a copper deficiency? Uh, and if there are significant nutritional deficiencies, have you got to go hunting for alternative uh, additional pathologies? Is there potentially a gut pathology? Is there a metabolic disorder that you need to diagnose? Um, is there a, a an issue with consistent failure to thrive in the child? Are they normal for their weight and their percentile otherwise? Does it look as though uh, you, you are concerned regarding neglect in the child as well? Uh, willful or deliberate um, leading to a deficiency of anything? Um, is, is this a disuse osteopenia, perhaps from a child who uh, suffers from a neurological condition uh, where their bones are weakened through misuse? Is the child suffering from a chronic case of kidney or liver disease um, leading to metabolic uh, disorders uh, affecting bone metabolism? Uh, I, I have seen, even in my limited time, some fairly weird and wonderful things. Um, the sort of things that you hear about in medical school and think, I'm never going to see that. Why do I need to know about that? But despite the fact we're told about horses and zebras, you do see a fair number of zebras once you start working in your own definitive specialty. Um, I thought it was worth mentioning consenting for patients. I'm biased towards England in this slide, I'm afraid, but for those of us working in England, when it comes to things like non-accidental injury, concern for patients, need for operative intervention, all that sort of stuff, um, gillet competence is a term used to describe a court case uh, which was about a young girl under the age of 16 who um, was prescribed contraceptives by her general practitioner and the parents took the GP to court 
on the basis that the child was unable to consent being below the age of 16. And the legal ruling essentially stated that if we deem a child to be capacitant under the age of 16, uh, they can consent to a procedure provided they meet the terms of being able to understand the information, or retain it, weigh it up and communicate it in the same way as it would do for adults. Um, if the legal guardian isn't present for the child, you can't consent that child. Um, if the kid turns up from school with a teacher, uh, the teacher is not legally able to consent for the child. Um, however, uh, you must clarify where the guardian is and do your best to discuss it with them and contact the parent uh, in order to try and uh, make sure you fill in the consent form too. So in England, consent form twos are the forms that we use for uh, pediatric patients uh, undergoing surgical procedures. And um, if they are not available, you need to escalate your consultant and your legal team. Um, it is quite rare that you will need to take a child to theater there and then or overnight. Um, supercondylar fractures, even which used to be operated on overnight, the BOST guidelines for supercondylar fractures, provided there's no suspicion of neurovascular deficit, those all wait to the next day uh, for, for a daylight operating list. Um, for patients who are unable to consent due to um, mental state or unwellness, uh, we, we do have a thing, a thing called a consent form four in England, uh, which is the, the sort of ones that we use in patients with sort of advanced dementia or if they are so unwell that they are delirious. Um, but if you cannot consent the child and the parent as well or the guardian as well, it's important to escalate it. Um, I had a couple of slides on wire orthopedics. I might as well do those while I'm here. Um, if I'm selling especially to you, um, as a side note, it's, it's awesome. Um, there's, a, there's a massive variety. We, we've talked about pediatric cases for about an hour now, and, and we've only covered two topics. Um, when I go to teaching, uh, you know, we talk about one topic for an hour. You really understand the whole gamut and spectrum of age of patients. You, you're working with neonatal children to uh, pediatric patients all the way up to advanced elderly patients. And there's a wide range of abilities in those patients as well. You're working with the uh, elite athlete all the way uh, down to Doris who just wants to play balls on a Sunday. Um, there's a huge procedure variety in orthopedics. You're working all the way from the clavicle to the fingertip. Uh, the pelvis down to the toe and there's a huge variety of procedures that you can develop your skill set in um, and it's every, every day is different with trauma and the way that you approach strategies and develop uh, ways to manage these uh, these injuries I just find it fascinating um, it's an incredibly exciting specialty you know you never know what's going to come through the door on a trauma call it's incredibly innovative um, it's not just a hammer and nails I mean at the moment uh, people are developing skill sets in computer guided and CT and laser guided uh, hip joint arthroplasty, minimally invasive procedures, new approaches, uh, new approaches to developing periprosthetic joint infection uh, and, and the sort of the centralization of arthroplasty revision services across the country over the next few years. And there's extensive academic opportunity with all this stuff if that's what you're into for MDs, PhDs, um, and, and sort of publishing research papers. For those of you who may have been put off by the fact that it's um, traditionally been stuffy men in our tweed blazers, um, fortunately, it's an increasingly diverse group with appropriate representation. The women in surgery group uh, spearheaded at the front by the Royal College of Surgeons England um, is really pushing to make sure that we are a more inclusive group. Uh, Claire Marks, who was initially the BOA president, British Orthopaedic Association president, was the first female president of the Royal College of Surgeons England. So it's an orthopod leading the charge on that front. And the British Orthopaedic Training Association Culture and Diversity um, Group is again working very, very hard to make sure that the group is representative of the patient population that we have and of the uh, people who are training in the profession. Uh, it's got some of the highest levels of patient satisfaction that exist. The patient reported outcome measures for hip joint arthroplasty suggests that it is the most uh, successful procedure that has ever been invented. Um, it, it leads to a complete new lease of life in individuals if you can fix them after trauma uh, and, and manage their elective conditions. And there's an increasing need for our services. Numbers for trauma are going up exponentially year on year. Uh, in fact, it's suggested that we're gonna have around 30% more uh, uh, hip fractures in an elderly population by 2030 or 2032 um, and the elective backlog is ever increasing as, as you probably are well aware from uh, news media 
And um, if you're financially inclined, there's excellent private opportunity in Tino, which is always worth saying. Um, I can take questions now from people if they want to shoot off. I'm happy to stop talking and stop waffling. Uh, I'm happy to go back and discuss cases. I, I will take it from as, as, as people want it. Uh, that's perfect. Dom, I just have one question here from Mary. She said, do you admit if you suspect any AI? Yeah, 100%. Get them in. Get them in. The, it's, it's often very, very sensitive to how you're going to approach these issues. And it's often a very challenging conversation. Um, you know, do you, you know, do you confront the individuals directly? Do you refer them to the safeguarding team and let them deal with it and wash your hands of it? Um, and, and I, my, my personal approach is to kind of go somewhere down the middle. I, I, I often say to them that it's important to admit that they're a child, uh, that we're concerned about the injuries that they've sustained and that we would like to form some further investigations, um, and, and some tests and observe the child and observe the fracture because we're worried about it. And that's normally how I explain things to people because that is true. Uh, we are concerned about the child, we're concerned about the injuries and we want to uh, monitor them um, for, for safety reasons. Um, if they push on why that reason is, uh, you've just got to try and respond to the conversation and try not to escalate things and emphasize that you know you want to keep their kids safe and, and uh, I've yet to come up, I'm sure there are scenarios that exist where people have refused to admit their child and things have all kicked them off. But fortunately, I've never been in that position. Um, but I, I always think, you know, we have specially trained teams to deal with this. I am not specially trained to deal with this. And so I, I will sort of do the best I can given the circumstances, I guess. Thank you very much for the answer. I think that cleared it up. Okay, we, we still have uh, 57 people here. Um, it's entirely up to you, Dom. I know we took a lot of your your uh, evening. Uh, longer making the presentation than it did delivering it. I will tell you about that. If, if, um, if, if, if people wish to sign out now, uh, Shainara, nice seeing you. Please feel free to email me with any questions, either orthopedic or career related. Um, I'm happy to do the other couple of presentations if people want to stick around. Okay, cool. So until, uh, so if you're still uh, interested in the chat for the cases that we can go back to, please let us know. Uh, otherwise, the rest of you, uh, the feedback form for your certificate uh, should be emailed to you, but it will also be in the uh, chat box. So uh, once you fill it, you'll automatically receive your certificate. I look forward to your one-star review, Gan. <laughs> no, honestly, I've I've been listening to everything you said, and I and I thought it was really interesting. I, I myself like learned a lot from 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 everything. Uh, very interactive, uh, very well delivered. Right, I'm giving people one minute to escape. I'll so a few a few people are interested in the cases. Uh, okay. we, we have lots of people actually interested in the cases. Right. So, right. Yeah. so super cons of the fractures. So we've done forearm fractures, we've done a septic joint. So those are two of the British Orthopedic Association standard guidelines for trauma um, with a particular emphasis on kids. Uh, super of the fractures are another topic with a BOST guideline. They frequently come up in uh, postgraduate examinations and they're a really important topic because they're one of the more serious kid injuries. Um, it's worth pointing out a couple of bits of uh, details on this uh, x-ray. Uh, that's an ulna, that's a radius, that's your epicondyle that's come on and off end. And as this is a lateral view with the elbow at the back here, your anterior humeral line is literally just a line drawn down the front of your humerus. And I thought I wasn't going to need to explain that to people, but when I trialed this on the fifth year medical students earlier for this presentation, they thought this was a knee. So uh, I've added this x-ray explanation in. So in this scenario, the A&E department call you and they are worried about a seven-year-old right-hand dominant boy who fell from a trampoline onto his left hand and they've taken the following x-rays. So can anybody describe to me what this x-ray shows and how they are going to approach the acute management of this patient?
What do we think is on the X-ray? I think uh, people are a little bit hesitant reporting the X-ray, but I have somebody here who said medial displacement. All right. Here's a clue. If it's a question on supercondylar fractures, what do we think it might be? Ha <laughs> ha. That's a top tip for med school finals, by the way. Take the clues from the STEM. Um, so yeah, so so this the way I'd approach answering this is uh, again, say what you see. Okay, so this is an AP, and it's a lateral view of a left elbow, and you can tell that this is the left elbow because look, there's your radial head. And there's your capitella that comes up around the back, all right? So um, this is a left elbow in a skeletally immature individual. And again, you can tell that they're skeletally immature because you can see that you've still got ossification centers around the back of there. Look, see? So I, uh, a barb elbow back slab has been applied. So that's what this big thick line is here. This here is a back slab above the elbow. And this fuzziness down the side is also a plaster cast, all right? So if you can see a cast on the image, uh, worth saying, okay? Um, what this actually displays is a Gartland three supercondylar fracture, which you don't necessarily need to worry about the classifications, but what this has here is, as was quite rightly said, it's got medial translation of the epicondyle fragment, and this anterior humeral line you can see has been disrupted so it doesn't form down to a congruent joint surface here um so yeah it's a super conflict factor excellent um so what is our approach to acutely managing this injury now we're going to assume for the purposes of your approach to acute management that the above elbow slab has already been applied and you've gone down to ED and they say, can you see this kid? So you're there, it's been reduced. What you do? Uh, Lubna said, uh, check the neurovascular status. Love it. Uh, Eleanor said, examine the patient. Love it. Uh, and review post-reduction x-ray. Uh, Rebecca said, conservative management, uh, analgesia. So with the... With this case, okay, when you already go down to see the patient in ED, you are entirely correct that you must re-examine the neurovascular status. Now remember, the BOST guidelines for supercondylar fractures state that you must individually document the function of the median nerve, the radial nerve, the ulnar nerve, okay? And with particular emphasis on the median nerve, the anterior interosseous branch of that nerve is quite it's at more risk with these fractures and some of the other nerves around there. So you particularly want to make sure that you've documented this bad boy, which we'll come on to in a second. You can see me, right? See me doing that? So you must document the function of each individual nerve, but before you jump to examining your patient, remember, revisit the history. Is the history that is presented to you, again, consistent with the history that's been documented by the emergency department? And if ED haven't documented anything, which they often don't, Go and speak to them, see the doctor that looked after them, the nurse that looked after them. It's worth saying to them, how is the interaction with the child and the parent? Does the parent seem appropriately concerned? So how did they tell you it happened? See if it all matches up, okay? Um, with the, regard to the acute management, again, this is a pretty significant injury. This is a Gartland 3, so it only goes 1, 2, 3, and 4, all right? So in fact, it's an off-ended distal humerus. Um, after rechecking your neurovascular status, again, depending on the time and the injury and all that sort of stuff, it is worth clarifying with the patient when their last meal was, so when they last had anything to eat and drink, your past medical history, previous surgeries, uh, looking at, explaining to them that it's a significant operation. Um, I don't know who said conservative management, but the, these are very serious injuries. So anything but the most minimally of displaced supercondylar fractures are likely to need theater. 
to the extent that uh, I certainly, as a new reg next year, I will anybody with a super condor factor that is anything but a hairline, I'll be admitting, um, because the guidelines suggest that these should be fixed on the next available daylight operating list, unless you are concerned about neurovascular dysfunction, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, you should uh, make sure you have adequate anesthesia as you said, and you should think about convincing and marking them, if you can, for a uh, fixation, which we'll talk about in a second. Right, so we talked a little bit ago about Gartland 1, 2, and 3. So in exams, even at the MRCS level, they are not going to ask about fracture classification types. Um, but when you're thinking about them, your main question is, is it a non-displaced fracture? Is it somewhat attached to the posterior edge with only a disruption of the anterior humeral line? So that line that we said we traced down there to where the condyle is. Or is it completely off-ended? Uh, there is a new uh, worst type where not only is it completely off-ended, the whole thing is contributed. So that bit where it goes into tiny little checks. Um, but anything but really a type one is looking at getting fixed. Okay. <clears throat> so the next question is, if instead of a hand that was neurovascularly intact, I know this is a much older hand, but if the child had a pale, pulseless hand and you couldn't feel a radial pulse, and you asked them to move their fingers and they weren't really doing it, what would you do instead? Somebody said uh, Doppler. Very good idea, actually. So I worked with some vascular surgeons who told me that Dopplers are great, and then I learned to use them. And then I went to my new unit where I've got vascular. So they said, why are you using Doppler? If you can't feel a pulse, you can't feel a pulse. Um, but no, I agree. I think a Doppler is a very sensible idea. What do I know? I'm a CT too. Uh, we have also check brachial pulse. Good like that and they go oh it really hurts so it's a pale pulseless hand my main question is are you going to a discharge the patient b admit the patient to the ward c have a discussion with your registrar about taking them to theater uh d something else so Don said, would you need sedation and immediate reduction? Brilliant. So sedation and reduction to try and get it into a better position if it's not entirely perfect is very sensible. But when you look at these Gartland trees that are off end, 10 to 20% of kids presenting with these injuries present with an absent pulse. Okay. And if the hand is pale, essentially it suggests that there isn't an appropriate collapse circulation remember the brachial artery comes down it splits into an ulnar and a radial uh, the ulnar forms the deep palmar arch the radial forming the superficial palmar arch and if it's pale it ain't, it ain't getting enough blood so if it is that you are discussing it with the boss that is the consultant because you are concerned that the hand has got a good blood supply and that the patient needs to go to theater overnight for emergent reduction and percutaneous pinning okay Definitive management is overnight, you think this patient needs to go to. So it is all of the stuff that you would normally do with preparing a patient for the operative theater that we've discussed, keeping them nil by mouth, checking that they've got appropriate inch fluids, checking their allergy status, discussing it with theaters themselves, seeing what's on the acute list, booking them, consenting them, marking them, all that sort of stuff. But you'll develop those skills as you go through your training. But it's 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 useful when the boss comes in to say, actually, I have done AC, you know, you, you've thought through some of the stuff that needs doing and you've done what you can to contribute to the management of the patient, including ringing anesthetics, um, because you want to try and expedite their treatment as much as possible. Okay? Um, so there are loads of options for uh, managing these cases in theatre. Um, I suppose, actually, if, if anybody can tell me what any of the guidelines are and how you can approach fixing these before I show you on the next slide, um, I'd be very impressed. Um, but hopefully while somebody types me a super clever answer, I thought it was worth mentioning the difference between anterior and osseous nerve injury and the 
hand of benediction and the okay sign. When you see, you, people see my hand, right? You can, you can see my hand? Yeah. Yeah. So your anterior interosseous nerve is responsible for this movement here for your pincer grip, because remember your median nerve supply is responsible for your flexor digitorum profundus and your flexor digitorum superficialis, as well as your FPL. So you've got your loaf muscles, so your flexor pulse is long of your finger. Now the benediction sign is one of two things. You get this from either A, when you flex the fingers, you are unable to flex your um, uh, your your anterior interosseous muscle. You can't flex that because your AI ends off. Or or B, uh, what you've actually got is an ulnar claw because you may notice that the ulnar claw, similar to that hand of benediction sign, is pretty similar. And remember that the ulnar claw is not to do with an issue of flexion. That is an issue of uh, extension because you have paralysis uh, of your um, your uh, flexor um, on the on the ulnar side because the ulnar half of FDP is supplied by the ulnar nerve as opposed to the flexor half uh, or the the other side being supplied by the median nerve. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Um, it's a it's a very fun thing you can read about for postgraduate exams. But anyways, the point is check that they can do this. All right. Anyways, hopefully somebody's typed out an excellent answer to uh, managing uh, these operatively. I'll pop the next slide and give you some answers then. Right. So. Essentially, you are using K wires to manage these fractures. Now, when you are looking at K wires, they come in a variety of thicknesses. Um, some are used for uh, holding bits in place while you put plates on. Um, some K wires are used as sort of a temporizing things, but the guidelines now recommend that uh, you use a minimum of two millimeter K wire for your fixations. Now, there is some controversy as to whether you should use these wires in a medial or a lateral configuration. Remember that around the medial epicondyle, where your funny bone is, your ulnar nerve runs posterior to that. So if you go sticking in wires blindly around the medial epicondyle, there is a reasonably high risk of recurrent ulnar nerve injury. So the guidelines again suggest that you must document your techniques to preserve the ulnar nerve mainly because if you internally rotate the arm you shift it out of the way so if you uh if you pronate the hand and try and move the ulnar nerve out of the way um or you do a percutaneous stab incision and then make sure you work your way down to the cortex directly you must document that in your post-operative note now as well as using a medial wire if you use a lateral wire on the lateral uh, epicondyle in a um, any sort of configuration that crosses over. There's some biomechanical studies that suggest that that is a more stable construct. But equally, some people use two lateral wires instead, and they don't put a medial wire in. Uh, some people use two lateral wires and a medial wire. Um, the key point is that when you are in theater, you consider the risk of the injury to the ulnar nerve. You try and learn from your consultant why they're doing what they're doing, uh, and you use a technique when you develop seniority that you're comfortable with. Um, for reference, I am not yet comfortable doing this at all without supervision, um, and I will do what the boss tells me. Um, but as you're going through your training, the important thing is to start trying to recognize why they're doing what they're doing and the anatomy of why you're doing what you're doing. And then hopefully we'll be able to do it. Uh, so the last case is a afebrile pediatric hip. And uh, in contrary to the last child that was a tiny bebe with a, a pyrexia, this is a happy child who's actually all of a sudden now complaining of hip pain. They don't always look like this, but the the common exam scenario is it, it's, it's always an obese 12 year old boy every time. Um, so you were called to review a 12 year old boy in ED, told you. Um, so you're told he's got a painful left knee and he's got an antalgic gait. So an antalgic gait is simply a posh term for uh, hobbling along in pain. Um, the kid is afebrile and there's no other change to his new score or parameters. Um, 
So we've done the approach to the patient's death. We know that we're going to have a high suspicion for NAI. We're going to do a systematic approach with an ATLS approach, examine the joint above and below. Uh, so I want to ask you what your differentials are for a kid who is presented with, remember, left knee pain. Uh, so Mary said uh, Suf and uh, Elnor. So all of them are saying uh, uh, Elnor said Perthes disease. Uh, slipped upper femoral epiphysis, uh, yeah. slipped upper femoral epiphysis, so three of them, yeah. yeah. So, remember, he has presented with knee pain, so he might also have some knee problems. Um, has anybody got any differentials to me as to what knee problems he might have? Uh, somebody said, can it also be growing pains? Yep. What is it? Could be anything. Um, and particularly, one thing that's really important when you start, I, I'm not sure how senior you are in the group, guys, because I can't see the chat, but when you start clocking in people and looking after people independently, the trick is not to make uh, assumptions. Now, I have given you a picture of the typical Perthes Sufi patient. But when you are looking at people, you must not assume that what's come before you is correct. Um, I, you know, I've seen patients who have been admitted with a gastritis on the medical ward who ended up having uh, pancreatic obstruction secondary to a malignancy who have ended up going for gastric bypass procedures. Um, you, you know, people who present with something written down by somebody else or, or, or with a preconceived view in mind, you must cast your net wider. It may be the fact that this is trauma. It may be that actually he's got knee pain secondary to non-accidental injury. And I'll keep banging on about that, but it might be. It could be that he's got a infection of the joint, which has grumbled along insidiously, and he's not yet pyrexial, um, but he's certainly got some osteomyelitic picture going on. It could be a tumor um, of the bone. I, I mean, I've picked up tumors in kids even working six months in LGI. Um, it could be Oscar Schlatter syndrome. It could be patellar tendinitis. It could be patellar femoral syndrome. It could be fat pad syndrome. It could be a spontaneous hemarthrosis because they've got an undiagnosed hematological disorder. Cast your mind wide. Is it infection? Is it tumor? Is it trauma? Is it other? And if you try to keep those things in mind, you're, you're not likely to go wrong. Anyways, right, so we've got some sensible differentials now. So my next question is, you do some bloods because you were suspicious about septic arthritis and his CRP and his white cell count are both normal and you've examined his knee and you've done the flexion and extension, you've tested for his ACL and his PCL with your anterior and posterior draw test, you applied various and valgus stress to the knee looking for any deficiency of the medial or lateral collateral ligaments, you've also been super, super cruel and you've also crunched his menisci using a McMurray test. But anyways, all of that's completely normal um, and his plain knee film isn't showing anything. So what are you going to do now? So we have examined the joint above and below. Brilliant. Genuinely, no, that's that's excellent. So you, you examine his hip and um what yes, is the history? As what well, and his history as well, as well as examining the hip. Can anyone remember what I said is worth examining earlier on? Uh somebody said spine. Spine. Examine the spine and check their gait. Well done, guys. Cool. Right. And we've done that. We've done a full history. And uh, we've examined the hip, and we think the hip's a bit dicky, so we've got some plain hip films. So, what does this show? So, Sophie, uh, somebody said, Sandra said, Sophie. Oh, my laptop's not very happy. What must I force quit?
Oh dear. Give us a second. Hello, yes, uh, sorry, I know you guys can't see anything. Um, Dominic just had some uh, technical issues with his laptop, but uh, he's just telling me that it's going to take him a minute or two and he'll be back uh, on with us. So apologies, but just uh, please bear with us for a, for a minute or two.
Hello, Domia. You're back on stage. I can't hear you, but I can see you. So I can also see your slides. Oh, I'm back. Can you hear me? I cannot hear you, however. Uh, maybe you can try leaving the the call. Leaving the call and coming back, and people won't hear me. If you press on the the red uh, end button there and just try and join again. No, it's not working yet. Oh, damn, I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Hello. Hi, 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 Dom. Yeah. Right, okay. Oh, okay. So, hang on. So, I've got, I've got I've got the boss on the phone and on the screen. So, can somebody type once again if you can hear me now on this? If you've stuck around to the last minute. All right, they can. Okay, they're gonna have to make do with this. Okay. Uh, Grant, all right, I suppose I can just ask, I'll flick between the two. All right, cool. I'm, I'm going to hang up on you now, dude. Huh? Okay, right. So uh, did we have any, again, thanks Thanks for waiting. Um, sorry, I kicked me out the chat. Right. Do do we know, um, what, sorry, I kicked me out the chat. Right. Do do we know, um, what, sorry, I'm free throws. Lost all the over now it's back. Right. Should be fine for the final time. Um can anyone tell me about the final time? time? Cool. Thank you for bearing with the IT issues. Okay. So can anyone tell me what this X-ray now shows, this AP view of the pelvis? I promise we're gonna get through these cases really quick. One last. You can't see the slides. Oh, for goodness sake. Can you see this? Oh, quality, right, okay. Can anyone tell me what this x-ray shows now if you can all see it? Thank you.
Yeah, excellent, Eleanor. So uh, this is a, a it's it's a slipped upper femoral epiphysis. So I realize that the x-ray is not the best one to see. So if you look a little bit closer here on this AP view, somebody earlier on actually suggested to me that this was a fracture line. However, if it matches on both sides exactly, it's probably less likely to be a fracture. Well, that's better if I turn the brightness up. It's less likely to be a fracture, potentially more likely to be a growth plate. So when you're looking at dysplasia, the question is whether or not the actual head of the femur is well within the socket. And, and as you can see on both sides, that it looks as though it's nestled in quite snugly, but this epiphysis here doesn't quite match up on, uh, on, on both sides. And hopefully I'll be able to show you a couple of tips for picking that up in a second. Um, so this is a different x-ray from a different patient for a different condition. Can anyone tell me what this x-ray shows? Eleanor and Sandra smashing it again. Yes, so this is a patient who is presented with bilateral uh, Perth's disease. Uh, all right, for a bonus point show offs, uh, what stage is it? Nah, it's all right, it's probably a bit of a cruel question. Right, okay, so slipped upper femoral epiphysis, so uh, Essentially, it's a it's a condition where, as it sounds, you you've got the head of the femur, uh, you've got the proximal bit of the femur here with the trochanters, and in between the two, uh, you've got the epiphysis. So this bit in here where the growth plate lives, uh, and essentially what has happened is the the ball has slipped down of the head of the femur into the joint, and and you no longer have a, a congruence of the uh, metaphysis of the bone. Uh, and, and the atta attaching to this this growth plate here, and when you're thinking about fixing Sufis, um, uh, it's essentially they're, they're they're well they're really quite a controversial topic. Um, without going too much detail into it, the the main point of detail regarding a slipped upper femoral epiphysis is looking at stabilizing the hip joint itself and minimizing the risk of any further slips of the hip. And really, it's at discretion of the consulting surgeon as to uh, what the timing of the surgery should be, uh, whether attempted reduction is needed, or whether they think that that's going to likely impede any potential epiphyseal blood supply that remains if there's any cortical contact left, much the same way as when we see individuals with young hip fractures undergoing fixation to attempt to spare the femoral head. Um, which should be done on a consultant operating list with a dedicated hip surgeon so that it's done perfect first time. Similarly, if, if you see somebody with a slipped upper femoral epiphysis, the key point is don't start wiggling around the leg too much. Keep them non-weight bearing so they're not putting any weight through the affected joint. You don't necessarily need to immobilize them, um, but it's worth quantifying what the mobility status of the patient is. Some classification systems for upper femoral epiphysis look solely at a clinical perspective. So uh, I think it's the Lord L classification that looks at whether the patient is ambulant or not. And other ones look very specifically at angles uh, in the hip. Uh, you can look at things like the line of Klein, which draws through the lateral aspect here of, not lateral, sorry, the superior aspect of the femoral neck and see whether that comes down and intersects as it should. Or you can look at frog's length views at the cyclic angle and see if there's been collapse. Um, you can read about them in your own time if you want. I thought it would be a bit out with the scope of this talk. Um, but with regard to managing these patients operatively, again, it's controversial. It may be the case that you need to add in things like a femoral neck osteotomy. So taking chunks and cutting out of the bone in order to change the angle uh, of the bone in order to change uh, the line of force going through it and then applying additional screws. And it may be the case that the surgeon thinks it's worthwhile doing a prophylactic fixation on the other side. Um, not every surgeon does this. Um, it's the same thing when you're exploring testes for torque. Uh, often they will put a stitch in uh, at the other side so that you prevent torsion of the other side, but not every surgeon will prophylactically fix a, uh, the, the other side if there's no suggestion that there will be a slip on the other side. Um, 
So you want to mark them, you want to consent them, you want to keep them non-weight bearing for a prophylactic fixation uh, and suggesting them that it will be at the consultant discretion, but that you just want to make sure that they're as ready and optimized for the morning as possible. Now, on the other hand, Perth's disease um, really describes a condition where you have got uh, avascular necrosis of the femoral head. And what you eventually see is a weakening and flattening of the femoral head as it sits well within the socket. And it, it goes through a, a number of stages, essentially. Um, and, and the vast majority of management for Perth's disease is, um, is, is conservative. Uh, initially, in, in the first stage, what you see is, is that the severity of the AVN and the time of progression alters the blood supply, leading to progressive erosion and fragmentation of the femoral head. And provided you are able to manage things appropriately with physiotherapy, with conservative management strategies to keep the hip non weight bearing, keep it in joint and keep that contact, you may actually be able to induce spontaneous healing in that without any need for operative intervention. Um, and as time progresses and the width of the femoral neck increases, uh, what happens is the femoral neck itself, you can see here, fattens out in order to try and support the weight bearing aspect of the joint better as your cortical contact from the head itself and the joint reduces. And the main part about management of Perth's disease is, again, it is highly controversial and it is super complex depending on what stage you get it in. Now, you've got these old-timey textbooks which give you examples of prophylactic measures to try and manage these patients where you've got traction uh, and suspension of the leg in order to try and actually pull the joint there up into uh, the, the actual acetabulum in order to try and increase the, the contact of the femoral head, strategies to keep their... Um, their legs in toed in order to try and again internally rotate the hip so that you reduce the space in the pelvis and increase again the contact with the femoral head um, and sometimes that doesn't work now if you are looking at managing these operatively you are well within the realms of specialist orthopedic consultant territory but it is worth pointing out some principles which you may find uh, interesting um, certainly uh, the sort of the less invasive type approaches with osteotomies or potential fixations. And you, here you have a variety of screws which are being used to hold the osteotomy in place. And you can see that there's little rings uh, around these screws here. The reason that those are done is to try and stop the countersink of the screws into the bone itself and give a little bit more contact and support for that. Um, but if that doesn't work, you sometimes need to go for much, much more extreme measures where you've got to go for acetabular osteotomies, where you can see these screws come in here to hold the acetabular in place. You can end up needing to do further um, controlled breaks of the hip in order to try and rebuild it with plates and screws and hold it in place. Um, and I've seen in, in a rare number of cases, and again, I'm quite junior, but individuals who are in their late 20s or early 30s with such bad intractable hip pain that they're coming in for uh, sort of hip resurfacing procedures where you essentially shave down the acetabulum to try and hope that that settles things down or you end up with sort of these minimally invasive femoral head replacement type things without going for a total hip arthroplasty with uh, surclage wires in order to try and hold that in place. So it really runs a whole spectrum of management but the key point is that the majority of it's conservative and depending on the patient's symptoms, you may want to admit them anyway uh, to, to make sure that they're followed up appropriately by the pediatric specialist and expedite the plan, particularly if they are looking as though they are coming through at one of these much, much later stages. But individuals with some hip pain that's settling down, um, you know, you may, you may think it's worth... Uh, uh, discharging them but again I'd caution against it simply because if they come in and they keep them on weight bearing they can start getting an appropriate physiotherapy plan and you won't be accused of causing any further damage. Um, right that is uh, that is now it. I've taken up enough time of everyone's. Again I'm offering the floor to questions if uh, anybody has any. I will take, thank you. That's all right, I realize that that's not a question, but that's fine.
I have to verify my account in order to put anything in the chat. Oh, that seems complex. So, I right, thank you for all the feedback. Um, sure, if anyone's got anything to add, you can either call me and I'll put them on speakerphone. Um, again, you know, I was once putting that slide up with my email address if anybody wants it again. Yeah, so I'll keep my email address on screen for a second if anyone wants to take a note of that. As I've said, if anybody is at the stage where they're thinking about a, a career in orthopedics and they want to ask any questions, if anybody is thinking about uh, tips and tricks for core surgical training um, and looking at getting into that, or they have any questions about that recruitment process or getting on, involved with how to prepare yourself for that later on down the line, um, tips and tricks, if anybody needs anything for the MRCS, I'm happy to discuss that. Um, if anybody is thinking about applying for things like the Academic Foundation Program, um, I also managed to do that and, and, and was uh, successful in those interviews as well. So if anybody's at that stage as well, I'm more happy to ask, uh, offer advice on that as well. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if you get into my inbox, I'll do my best to reply when I can. Cool. Other than that, I will. Uh, thank you very much, Dom. That oh, was a oh, really, fine. really interesting talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, if somebody has any questions, like Dom was saying, sorry, I'm hearing myself twice. Uh, I, I mean, at least it, the the RT issues were just right at the end because I can hear myself three times. I don't know what's the problem. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, everybody, for being with us today, especially those who were all the way till the end. Uh, we've sent the feedback form. Uh, uh, just make sure to fill it and you can get your certificates um, immediately. And thank you very much, Tom, for your time. Um, I know it was like two hours of your time, so thank you very much for well, that. Most of that was IT in my defense. So, Grad, but no, uh, thanks guys. Uh, <laughs> it was IT, there was a lot of, uh, I mean, we usually have IT issues. Yeah, All right, cheerio guys.